think this is the last session, right? So I already. So again, my name is Ronnie Ephraim from Elanox. Um, I already presented today things, and now we want to go over how to, if you remember, or pre uh, present the SRLV offload and how we can do it. Uh, what the component that we add to the hardware, uh, sorry, uh, to the Linux, and now I want to show how we can use it and to do like um, a switch that is using it, and kind of a switch we took as, uh, as the OpenV switch, of course. So I want to remind you what, what we add. So we add the basic, basic stuff, So we had, of course, uh, the representer one that's, that act like a, a virtual port. That's, this is the port of the switch, the side of, inside the, the switch. Uh, in order to do the receive, transmit packets, uh, counters, uh, link state. And of course, the second thing that we need, it's the flows. So the flows is done through TC, so you can add the, config, the flow configuration, you can do ACL, you can do the forwarding, anything that's needed. And of course, the same thing you use in order to read the counters. You, you have a counters, of course, per, for each port, but you need to have also counters for flows if you want to do aging and those thing, kind of stuff. And we already, we already extended the TC interface to support uh, VXLAN. So that's the building blocks that I'm going to use. Um, so again, the, the idea of um, of this uh, 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 slow data pass that can uh, can use the infrastructure that we build in order to have a, a switch. So we use the default uh, behavior that if you don't have any forwarding rules, so we give this uh, port. Uh, we, sorry. We give the, a, a packet that is coming in. The default does is to take it out to the to the main to the main CPU, and let the, uh, the the software process it. So in order to process it, we're using of course the um, the representer. The packets uh, have a miss in the hardware. Go to the representer, and then the representer is giving to the software switch that decide how what to do with this packet. Probably what he will do, he will try to, to find, to look on his tables what need to be done and to try to offload it to the hardware because the idea is to do it everything in the hardware so he will probably call the TC command in order to, that then the following packet will, will follow the, the hardware and he also will send this packet of course on the Representer port in order that the packet that's go to the slow path will continue on his way to the to his de destination. Um, okay, uh, so we added a uh, flows uh, into the uh, into the hardware. Um, what happened when you have a hardware offload for that is that you don't have the, the you don't have any traffic uh, in the on the slow path on the CPU. So what will, if you will try to, to do the aging, you will, you will look on the counters and the counters will see zero because they're not traffic in the hardware. Eh, sorry, they're not traffic in the, on, the, on the software. Everything is going through the hardware. So in order to do that, we need to, prop the, to, to collect the counters uh, from the hardware. We use the TC in order to do that because this the, the same interface that we add the rule, this is the same interface that easily can get you the statistic of that. And then, of course, we collect the statistic. Uh, usually, a switch, what we'll do, we collect statistic every 30 seconds. We'll see the one that is not being used, and we'll age them. Um, so that's how we use the, the statistics with the, from the TC in order to do the aging. And also counters, if you want to debug and everything, everything as uh, uh, required. You, you want to debug, you want to see the traffic, you want to see that everything is flowing, and if it's not flowing, or where it's flowing to. So it's 
handy to, to do the debug. Uh, we also kind of understand that there need to be a policy. So uh, in the beginning we saw that, okay, everything put to the hardware. And we kind of understand that there are sometimes need to be a policy what you take into the hardware. Because not every time you need to, you want to take everything to the hardware. And sometimes there are a pure policy decision like you want to, to say that's a specific flow, you want to, to, to limit this bandwidth, to do, to do any special things or, or even to debug. You want, sometimes you want special flows to go to the, through, the, through the kernel in order that you want to do uh, to debug or maybe to, uh, to do a TCP dump on them even. So this is a special cases. Sometimes there are a policy that's come from from sysadmin that want to do it. And of course there are cases for the, that the hardware is not supporting things. So the idea of if the hardware is not supporting it, of course we want to continue the, to work. So what we're doing, we're handling it in the software. So the software will do the, the job. And this will, compl will give us a, a full solution that's in any case, because sometime, every, even that we will do a, the best hardware for the current time, uh, the software will, as a software will, is very flexible. We will define new things that we want, and the hardware won't support it. So the, the idea that we can support it in the in the slow path of a, a, like a para virtualized environment. So we won't have something that is not working. So if even if we accelerate uh, half of the traffic, we did half of the, the half of the job. Later on, the, the, um, the slow path of, uh, the done in, this, in the software can do the, all the tricky things that the hardware can't do. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit about the Open vSwitch. I think it's one of the dominant uh, uh, switch, switching that uh, they are using. I think OpenStack already adopted as, a, as the default one. Um, uh, so open this switch is working like um, it's a it's a flow based switch, and the idea is that every uh, they have a, a kernel module and a software uh, software part uh, uh, sorry and a user part. Every packet is coming through the kernel. Uh, they have a, a flow table in the kernel. If there is a, a, a match, they're forwarding the packet and do the actions. If not, the packet is going to user space for a, a very slow path, and then he can compare it through all the table, the open flow table, the, the, the bridge configuration, the macro learning, the spanning tree, and all other configurations, and decided what he's going to do with this packet after, after he, he collects the information from all the tables. And then he, he used the kernel as a, as a cache. So if you, for, you get the same packet again, we know what we need to do with that. We don't need to, 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 to go all, all over the, all the tables. So the kernel, the kernel model of, uh, of, is doing a, a cache. Um, what we, we did with the um, OVS offload hardware acceleration, so we keep, we keep the, the same idea, but we have another layer below. So this is the lower one. So it's, and we extend the same idea. So the packet is coming to the hardware. If there are no match in the hardware, it go to the kernel data path. If it's not handling the kernel data path, it's going to the user space. And when the flow is configured from the vSwitch, from the user space, he can configure it to the data path of the kernel, or even to do it, to take it lower level inside to the hardware, according to the policy. So th that's the, um, how we're going to accelerate it. So again, what we will have, that's, we have the same model of open vSwitch. The user get, uh, have the same experience 
He used the same tools. Everything is the same. He have an open flow support. He have uh, the, all the open stock. Everything is working the same as used to. But he get a hardware acceleration for that. Um, we already have a beta for that. Um, uh, I mean, we will publish a, a demo, of course, on, uh, on YouTube. I don't have it right now. Uh, and we have a very, very nice uh, performance numbers. Um, so our performance number we are using also for VXLAN. We do a VXLAN encapsulation for the traffic. And we have about a 25 or almost a 30 million packets per second without any CPU that is uh, needed to, in order to, to do that. So if you can, because the comparison, the, we comp, comp, the, the one that we are comparing to is a, is a DPDK, it's not a Linux, yeah, we know, but uh, we compare it to the DPDK Open vSwitch and we got a much better performance with zero CPU because usually a DPDK OVS is for, uh, using a, a four or more uh, cores in order to forward uh, 10 or 15 million packets per second. And we get almost a double than that and without any core that's uh, required to do that. And the server can use those four cores, extra cores, in order to, gener to have another VM that's or, or more than uh, a single VM with uh, four cores. So this is the... Um, the performance that we are having, I think they are very nice. And of course, in order to do that, uh, this is, uh, we, always, uh, we, we need to, to, to make a little bit change of the open vSwitch. Um, this is the internal structure. What is not colored, this is the, the current uh, structure of the open vSwitch. And we want to use the same environment, the same without extending any any block of open vSwitch uh, to do it uh, to, to just to use the same API. So what uh, we did, we have the blue box that is an uh, internal level of uh, of OVS. It's a called a DPIF uh, provider. So what we did. We have a new DPF provider, a hardware acceleration provider, that is consulting the policy, what to do if to hardware it, offload it or not. And if it decides to hardware offload it, then you go through the TC API and configure the, the hardware with a skip software. This is the concept of a TC. And if not, he's using the old DPIF uh, that's the, the, the default one, the DPIF Netlink that is currently used in order to configure the kernel data path. Um, in, and in that way, we have a very, very thin layer just is reusing all the current code and, and not harming uh, any, any open vSwitch implementation that is not needed uh, the hardware offload. We already submit an RFC uh, almost a week ago, and we have some discussion of that, of course, but we didn't got any mainful objection. Um, that's all. Any thought, ideas, comment? So the when you poll for through TC to look at the hardware offload rules for the aging out, how well does that scale if you have a very large number of rules? Um, so currently we, we were in our beta we didn't do go through the TC interface, but now we know that we need to to see how the TC is uh, functioning because we our customer are looking for. 10,000 uh, rules uh, per second. 
for sure the, the TC interface work, we, I think we did some tests to see that uh, uh, a, a thousand rules per second, it's working very well, but it could be that when we will scale out, we will see that do we have some performance issue. Uh, so we need to test it, of course, we understand that. Um, and we think about other options if it required to to extend the, the, the performance, maybe to do bulking or maybe other optimization that need to be done there. Uh, so this might be a little, um, I guess, off topic for you, but it looks like this is pretty generic in terms of an offload interface. Right. Um, one of the interesting things we could do, um, and hopefully somebody will, will figure this out, uh, if we move the similar functionality in XTP, um, have OVS offload, I guess that would be onload into XTP, then that might be an interesting comparison versus DPDK. Um, just a thought, I think, yeah. uh, where's our VMware guy, um, might be a, an interesting uh, project to do in the future. Yes, but again, th this is a different approach because e the main, the, the host don't see the packet. And it, the host really doesn't see the packet in XDP either. I, th I think that's one no, of the things we glossed over. No, very you, still, you still get a packet that is coming and you need the, the XDP to, to work on it a little bit and to forward the packet to the VM. And in right. this approach you have a zero uh, CPU think, that is consumed. I think the point is that if you made an OVS to XDP uh, fast path and an XDP to hardware fast path, you would kind of get this for free. I think it doesn't seem to make sense for this case, right? So you, you're, he's asking you to put all the flaws basically in XDP, which sounds strange. Well, it's, it's, it's another approach. It's sure. not, you, it's not, you not utilize the hardware. You could. You could put the switch in there and put all the flaws. How many flaws do you have in there? Millions. Okay. So now you have millions of flaws in XDP. I'm not sure if that's the right approach. But you upload it. You offload XDP into the hardware afterwards, right? Yeah, but that's if you have a hardware that is optimized for XDP. This is a standard silicon. It's not an, uh, a multiprocessor one. It's not an SOC. It's not an SOC. It's a, it's a standard NIC. So the, the same it works also for the, for the Intel guys. The same concept. You don't need to have an SOC that can do the eBPF offload. It's just the same problem we've had earlier, right? It's a fixed ASIC and you're trying to take an eBPF instruction set down to it. It's quite a challenging task. But for a lot of folks, it doesn't make sense. If you, if you can get the eBPF onto the NPU or something, then I think it makes perfect sense. So like from an OVS perspective, looking at this, where there's this module in the middle that figures out it can offload to something else. I mean, if there's a XDP thing that sits there in the same model, it, it, it could do that, but it wouldn't be flow-based, it would be, obviously. Uh, but this kind of fits with, uh, with the hardware that Elanux has. The same approach could be used for, for offloading to other places. I mean, it proposes a policy module for how to offload things. And, yeah, maybe the XDP thing happens, I don't know. I'm not saying you couldn't do it. I'm just saying that this hardware can, uh, it can do it 10 times faster with 10 times more flaws. Maybe a different piece of hardware would do better. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay. Do we need some sort of lookup functions or TCAM equivalents in, in ABPF? Yeah, it can, it can do it, but it'll be about 10 times slower with 10 times less the flows. You, you take a concept like a, 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 a table concept or something that is a networking concept, you want to compile it to an eBPF, but the hardware can't do eBPF. The hardware can do 
classification, forwarding, and other actions. So the, the way that we want to optimize the hardware is to do the, the e rules of eBPF. eBPF is missing nothing, just like, you know, I don't know, 8086 isn't missing anything, right? You know, if, if you could retire 100 BPF instructions per block, sure, maybe you could do this. But what you need is a, a 256 wide bitmatch instruction in eBPF. Then you can start doing stuff that's at the speed that you need to do it. Um, but that's kind of my point. Maybe we need higher level primitives in BPF, like okay. do a TCAM match. And uh, yeah. I'll put it very simply. There's no in hell you can beat this static functions that exist in this ASIC with XDB. With, you can find another piece of hardware. Yeah, this NIC is too advanced for to replace with XDP. It has the exact functions needed. I, I think it's a question of figuring out what the right primit primitives are. Flexibility is different. This has fixed functions that are needed for this feature. Right. right. So what I'm saying is this thing has fixed functions and it's awesome. It's super fast. It can do it can do stuff that eBPF will never be able to match because it's running 8086 instruction sets. And you can't retire 100 eBPF instructions per clock. So you can't go as fast as this thing can. But if what you if you had in eBPF the ability to do what a TCAM can do, then suddenly you can do this stuff, but you can do the like the um, like the well, business logic or whatever, you can actually have the control flow be an eBPF program and you can do the super fast hardware stuff by just delegating that to the hardware. And so you can build a hybrid, right? So I, I think it makes sense. I mean, XTP is pretty early and we're still working on the infrastructure, but it, it makes sense to at some point look at optimizations like uh, the 256 bit registers and uh, hardware intrinsic um, so that, you know, that we could add to something like eBPF. Um, I think that would be a, a good direction. You probably could get quite a bit of improvement over the existing eBPF programs if you started to look at the, uh, you know, kind of other instructions, intrinsics, and wide, you know, wide instructions and stuff like that for sure. And close that, close that gap, and keep the flexibility. I think that would be uh, quite in, uh, a good, a good uh, experiment to go and run and see how close it can actually get. I mean, you're going to end up with a lot of uh, duplication of effort here between different vendors trying to implement similar offload mechanisms yeah. for other chips with slightly different architectures, right? And if we just had one mechanism to offload this into an XDP, EBPF, like sufficiently generic syntax, that yeah, but EB, EB, you would only have one thing to offload into the NIC. I think we have two yeah. modes, though. We have the instruction set mode, and then we have the fixed ASIC mode. And I have a really hard time trying to wrap my head around how those two can be merged into one high-level language. It's been tried and failed in various forums for years. Um, I think the pragmatic way to resolve it is to have two modes, a fixed ASIC mode that all the fixed ASIC guys have to use, and then an instruction-based mode that the NPU and the x86 and PowerPCs and ARMs of the world can, can use. I think you can look at it as kind of you first do fixed level matching that is like TCAM implementable and only then do you run the, the fixed instructions afterwards. But as input to those fixed instructions, you kind of already have information about which rule from the TCAM matched, um, <laughs> which potentially allows you to eliminate a large part of the parsing in the BPF. Yeah, that's another, actually, there's some, there's a few prototypes I've seen for this, actually, where they use the hard drive as a front-end parser for the back, for the back-end x86, so the x86 doesn't have to actually do any parsing. Um, the scheme is not specific to x86, right? It could work for any sort of instruction-based system where, where you use a hardware parser that can do everything in a couple cycles or clocks or whatever, and then it comes into the system with a tag that tells you exactly what the, what the packet is, and then you have the flexibility to um, append your kind of more flexible engine that lives behind this. So uh, th those schemes exist. It's just whether or not they fit into yeah, this yeah, model. But you, what you mentioned, it's, it's not like you forwarding all the, uh, not f uh, offloading all the forwarding. What do you mean? You, you, you take part of the forwarding stuff that you can do in the silicon, all the parsing, all the, those kind of thing, and give you a flow ID. And then you do the action of forwarding in the software. That's, I think that's the model. I mean, that's the model that you're doing here. I think all we're pointing out maybe is that there are other models of doing this sort of processing. One being that the hardware can provide hints to the software, and the software can use those hints. 
Yeah, so this, I presented last uh, native conference, the, the same approach. But this is a different approach. We want to offload all the forwarding. We don't no, no, and, and we understand that. And you get very good numbers because you are offloading all right. of it. But it's not generic to other hardware, right? And, and Why not? That, because if I take my random NIC that I have that does 10 gigabits, it doesn't have this architecture and it doesn't have this driver and all this logic in it. And I can run normal Linux on it, and it works just fine. But I can't get offload like this, right? Right. So, you, so, so because so this is not supporting hardware offload, that, that's hardware offload for uh, for a kind of e-switch. Because if you take like an an Intel, I think John, so, correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, but an Intel NIC, the 40 gig NIC, also support yeah, this yeah, uh, the, the Intel scheme. Does support a similar model. It's just it's a common architecture for a lot of these NICs that do offloads. Well, if it's common architecture, then we should have common support for it. Yeah, he, he's, that's what he's showing. Yeah, I think yeah. Net, Netroom also support a kind of thing. To, the, the, they use currently, I think, the different API, not the TC, but yeah. they're also they're optimizing for specific functions only. There's a few functions exposed that everybody has. Right. Then those few functions should be somewhere in the BPF logic available. Mm. Why BPF? What? BPF is, a, is one approach, yeah. Why not P4, why not other TC? Because, we're just, because we're just ending up with too much of this. It's, it's hard to wrap your head around all the different mechanisms, and it's hard to program. And, but this is not you know, why, do we, why do we not write the kernel in Java, C, C++, and C Sharp in Objective-C? Because nobody wants to learn five different languages to do kernel programming, right? So this is basically the same thing. Um, you kind of want to make everything generic to one specific interface, not to five different interfaces. OK, but eBPF is not a, net net a native language for hardware. Yeah, if wants to come. So um, it's almost six, and I think we're rat holing a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, your, your operating system comment is true, but there's different operating systems. And there's going to be different implementations of this. So my only, my only point here is, as long as something like this is an open architecture, as long as if I want to add, say, a new protocol, I don't have to go out and buy new hardware to support that. If it's open and programmable, we're going to have different models of this. And again, if you look at the, the offload model, as long as this is truly offloading something that was done in, in the kernel or now being done in the hardware, which OVS is, I think it fits the model uh, that we're aspiring to. Trying to force everything in, into BPF model, you know, it's like Jamel said, that's, that's not necessarily easy. And I don't think we need, we need to try to do that. We're going to have different use cases for different things. And you know, I said it before and I'll say it again, a host is not a switch. And here we are definitely taking advantage of a switch capability. It'd be great to have that in BPF. But I don't think we can, at this point, try to force that model across the board. We are going to have P4, we're going to have apparently OVS, probably a few others, and BPF. Over time, maybe these converge, but I think this discussion is, is too early to have whether or not we can convert everything to one, one super uber offload model. I think we're running out of time, so. Yeah. Jim? According to the clock, we have six minutes. You still have six? You still have six we have a, a total delay. <laughs> yeah. Oh. All right. So, so okay, the, the scope of how many packets per second you can do in this is what? Uh, 100 gigabits, so that's close to 150 million packets per second? I said 30, million, 30 million packets per second. Th 30 million. 30, yeah. 3-0. Per, per core. Per, sorry, there's no core here. No core. So 30 million is about, what, 20, less than 30 gigabits. Huh? 20 gigabits. 20 gigabits. Why are you only doing 20 gigabits? It's 100 nick, uh, gig nick. No, we got, no. If it's MTU packets? Yeah. It you can do knows. full line rate. You can do full line rate, which is over 100 million packets per second. 30 million, pack, 30 yeah. million so packets per yeah. second. So, so the benchmark was 64 bytes that were encapsulated, right? So, so um, as, as you make the, uh, 
the flow is more and more complex. So um, you're hitting more, more steps in your hardware pipeline, and it's it's not today we're not in 160 million packets for uh, eSwitch VXLAN, right? Okay, and so you you have how many flows then in this in, in this demonstration? Of we, we support up to 64. No, but he's asking in our uh, in the our benchmark how many flows we have. I don't. Know. 64,000. Uh, okay. 64K. It's still... Uh, yes, you have the pipeline of each flow, how many steps in your pipeline it requires, right. and you have how many, how many flows you have. So, so I have, if I, so if I put 64,000, I mean, to, to answer you, to point to what he was saying, if I put 64,000 in, DB, in uh, XDP, I'll probably get a magnitude less packets oh, per I, second. I got it, yes. That, that, that was the point, I guess. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to make it <laughs> too. I don't think anyone's disputing that this would be right. slower in software, right. um, obviously. Uh, it's just that it could then be offloaded right in two steps. There's, there's no real API to XDP. That's <laughs> okay, that's, that's... Right, something okay. needs to be done. Sure. Okay. Okay. Any more comments? Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>